And we will be in Mark 2 today. Actually, we're going to start in Mark 1, to be honest with you. So, all right. You ever hear the phrase, desperate times calls for desperate measures? Yes. A few weeks ago, uh, I was broken down offshore, waiting for the Coast Guard to come rescue me. Okay? I think I'll tell you the whole story next week. But I had no food on the boat. And there was this 10-year-old kid, and he was eating these Cuban sliders from Wawa. And I'm going to tell you, be honest with you, I told myself that uh, if the Coast Guard took any longer, I was going to commandeer those sandwiches from that little kid, and I was going to eat them because desperate times calls for desperate measures. I remember one time when I was in uh, Honduras in high school on a mission trip, we were trying to visit this church at the top of a mountain, very remote area, and uh, we had a group together, and we got in these four-wheel trucks, and we went as far as we could up that mountain, and then when the trucks could go no further, we began to walk. And on this trip, I didn't have any water. And I remember I was getting so thirsty in that hot, deserty climate, and it was miserable. We finally got to the mountaintop, and we got to this church, and they served us all Kool-Aid. And I remember the missionary looking at each one of us and said, don't you dare drink this Kool-Aid. It will make you sick. It could kill you. Don't do it. And I remember I said, I am desperate. And I drank mine, and I drank my friends, and I drank the other guys, and I prayed, and nothing happened. I'm still here, okay? Um, But desperate times called for desperate measures. Have you ever been, those are silly stories, have you ever been in real desperation? You know, what if you had a disease that no one knew how to cure? How far would you go to find a treatment? Or if you had a child that was on the verge of dying, how much would you give up to save their life? If you had a disability and you had one shot to be made whole again, what if there was a demon tormenting your family? What would cause you to do something drastic to free yourself? You know, all these stories we're going to see in Scripture today. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked the earth. He began his public ministry after being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. All right, he fasted for 40 days in the wilderness after that, being tempted by the devil. And then he enters Galilee and he begins to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he begins to go around and preach and teach. And we're going to pick up what's going on in Mark chapter 1, verse 29. <clears throat> so, um, he begins to preach. He calls Simon Peter. He calls his brother Andrew. He calls James and John to these followers. And uh, it says in verse 29, it says, And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. And immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up taken her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. So here we have not the first miracle, but one of the first miracles. And Peter and James and John, you know, as they're at the house, they see that Peter's mother-in-law is sick and seriously sick. And they say, well, let's talk to Jesus about it. They talk to him about it. It doesn't say that he healed anyone really before this. He goes in, he touches her, and she's good. Wow. And then, of course, imagine for a moment that you heard that there was this guy that could heal people. You know, I mean, all of a sudden, everyone who was sick in that whole village, everyone who was nearby was like, what? Let's all go see. And he starts healing everyone. There are people that were possessed by demons. He starts casting them out and it just gets bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, his fame immediately begins to spread. If you look at verse uh, 35, it says in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. He said to them, well, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. He came to preach. So then it goes on. He goes up and goes. It says he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. At this point, a leper comes to him in a synagogue and he casts the or he he heals the leper. So look down at uh, verse 43. After this leper is healed, you know, leprosy is this thing in scripture where you just, you don't really get healed from. Like, you know, you go into your leper colony, you get away from everyone, and that's just your life from then on. But he heals this guy. So it says, so he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. 
So that's kind of our background, right? So imagine just Jesus is out here. He can't even enter villages because as soon as he does, everyone comes to him. They gather. He clogs the streets and he clogs the marketplaces. And everyone who is sick and everyone who has diseases and, you know, everyone who needs something just comes to Jesus because this guy, all of a sudden, he has power to change lives. And they never seen anything like this before. So Jesus is traveling. He's staying in these rural areas and people are flocking to him from everywhere. And he's preaching, and he's teaching, and he's healing. All right, so our main story here is in chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 1. It says, When he came back, when he had come back to Capernaum, several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. It says, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So imagine this scene. You got this little house, and Jesus is back home at his headquarters in Capernaum. You know, he just went from being a nobody to all of a sudden being, everyone wants to see this guy. His fame has gone abroad. Everyone is speaking. We read later that some people are like a prophet's comeback. Someone's like, Elijah has returned from heaven. You know, people are like, is is this like going to be the Messiah? What's going to happen here? Everyone is coming to hear what this new teacher has to say. So they come to his home and they fill up the home. They spill out into the street, right? You can't even get through the door. All this is going on. And now we see that there's this paralytic. So we don't know everything about him. We don't know if, you know, he could just not walk or if he could also not move his hands. You know, we don't know if he was born that way or if an accident had happened to him. You know, we don't know who took care of him. But I want you to kind of think about some of these questions and imagine this man's life in an ancient culture, in an ancient city, you know, to be paralyzed. I mean, there was no, there's no disability checks that could come his way, right? Right. Someone had to choose to let him live in their home. They had to take care of him. I mean, it's hard enough to be a paralyzed person in today's world, but imagine what he was like and sitting here. Now imagine what he first thought when he heard that there was this guy that was healing people. You know, maybe he was, you know, was he laying in bed and was he hear people talking? Yeah, there's this guy and, you know, he, he actually healed a leper the other day. Isn't that crazy? You know, imagine if there was someone in Kissimmee who all of a sudden was healing everyone who had problems and not with smoke and mirrors and not on TV, but and not with people you've never met, but people you knew that were sick their whole lives were going to this guy and all of a sudden they were better. Imagine that. I mean, what would you do? You would talk about it. People are talking about Jesus and he would be hearing them talk. And maybe there was this little thought in his mind, you know, something that popped up that was like, hey, I wonder if he could heal me. You know, maybe he was afraid to think that. Maybe he was afraid to hope that that could happen. Maybe he had already got his mind around the fact that he was a paralyzed man and he would stay paralyzed. Who would carry him anyway? We don't know if he begged these four guys, if he asked them, or if they volunteered. But clearly he got four guys and they said, all right, we're going to take you to Jesus. Jesus is in Capernaum. He's home. This is our chance. This is our shot. Can you picture him being carried down the street? You know, these four guys, you know, maybe there'd be some people that are like pitying him. I wish he wouldn't put his hope in that guy, that charlatan. You know, some people thought Jesus was a charlatan. Josephus wrote that he was a sorcerer, right? That he didn't believe in Jesus. Maybe some people just said, look at that fool running after this new guy. You know, there are others that came before him. They all died. You know, maybe there's someone on the way that they passed that had been healed. And he's like, go, go find him. You know, I can imagine these four guys going, which way is Jesus' house? You know, and they're like, follow the crowds. Just keep going. You know, maybe this man began to hope. But they get to this house, and all of a sudden they realize that it's packed. That they can't get through the door. They, they can't get in. Nobody cares enough to move out of their way. Maybe he could see Jesus teaching in through the, through the doorway. What do they do then? So it says in verse 4, being unable to get to him because of the crowd... They removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. So, like, what do they do? Do they give up? No. This is the paralytic's one shot at walking again. One shot at being healed. They know that if they can get this man to Jesus, everything will be better. If they can just get him there, everything will be different. So, and this isn't just some dream now, it's faith. They're like, we know that he can actually do this. 
So they go up onto this roof, and in those days, the roof was like a veranda, you know, that you would cook up there. You would take naps up there. Later, Peter is fasting and praying on his roof, you know. People hang out up there. It gets hot in the house without AC, you know. So they go up there. People used to, uh, you know, put palm fronds down. They used to put, you know, grass at, uh, or reeds after, like, the salt had got off the reeds. They would throw them down there and kind of make a carpet. So these men, you know, you can imagine them carrying this full-grown man up these stairs and getting onto the roof. It's like, okay, what's now? It's like, well, let's start removing some of this stuff and and sweeping it away. And now we're going to actually start to dig into the clay. And we're going to start removing the sticks, you know, instead of rebar. You know, they have these things. They're moving it. Can you imagine them digging into this while Jesus is downstairs talking? And it says it's Jesus' house. You know, it's, I love this story because, uh, you know, I can just imagine them breaking in. I mean, with stuff falling down, you know, dust coming down, pieces of clay, little rocks coming, you know, a stick falls down, people are staring up. You know, whenever we hear about people digging into a place, like they're digging into a hole, digging into a cave, it's always to rescue the person trapped inside. But these guys are like, no, we're, we're getting in. We're coming in. Was there murmuring in the crowd? They, big, they do a big hole. The guy can fit through it. They get some ropes. I mean, this is going to be loud. What is Jesus doing during this time? Is he just sitting there waiting for him? Is he still trying to talk, you know, and hoping, but nobody's looking at him anymore. They're looking up there. Anyway, they lower this guy down, you know, probably precariously. I mean, they get down to Jesus. And it says in verse five, Jesus, seeing their faith, Jesus looked at this act as an act of faith, their faith, not just the paralytics, but the four guys with him. He saw their faith. What kind of faith would you call that? I call it a desperate faith. These men and this paralytic were desperate to get to Jesus. Now, imagine if you were him. Wouldn't you be desperate to get to Jesus? All throughout Mark, we see that there's story after story of desperation. I'm going to read a few of them to you. You know, if you flip over to chapter 5, here's this woman in 525. I'll read you her story. It says, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. That's desperation. She had spent all of her money. She had gone to all the doctors. Nothing had helped. She had gotten worse. But then she hears the story about Jesus. He's healing people. So she goes. She's like, if I can just touch the corner of his robe, I'm going to be all right. So it says that she does that. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? Then you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Is that not desperation? Look at chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it. He could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread, throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. He said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon demon having left. Can you imagine that? She's a Gentile. She comes to this Jewish teacher and he's like, hey, please take this, tell this unclean spirit, leave my daughter. He's like, "I'm, I'm with the Jews. I'm not going to the Gentiles. It's not fair. And she's like, please, I'll take a crumb. How many of us would get up at him and be like, fine, I'm out of here. But no, she was desperate, desperate. In chapter nine. Verse 14, 
it says that when he came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with the spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. He answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. He asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. You see the desperation in his voice. If you can do anything, can you do this? Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Can you see the frustration in his voice? I believe. But he's also doubting because he's like, they couldn't do it. I brought him here. He's angry. He's frustrated. He looks to Jesus like, can you do this? He's like, I believe, but help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. One more. Look at Mark chapter 10. Look at verse 46. They came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Can you imagine his desperation that this may be his one shot and they're telling him to shut up. And he just yells out all the louder, Jesus, Jesus, because he sees, he hears that he's passing by. Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up. He's calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. These passages are filled with desperate people desperate to get to Jesus because they believed that Jesus was their only chance, their only hope. Bartimaeus would be blind forever if he didn't get Jesus' attention. That son would have continued to have been tormented until the demon killed him, unless this father could convince Jesus to, to free him. The daughter would have died. The woman would have wasted away. This paralytic man would have stayed paralyzed forever if he couldn't get to Jesus. They all believed that. And so they were desperate to get there. So you got to listen to me. Jesus is still the only hope. Jesus said that his messages were more important than his miracles. The miracles were signs that testified to the message. It is his word that saves. And Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter through the narrow gates, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into, con or does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. He said in John 3, 18, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 6, 40, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. I could go on. Jesus is the only way to God. There's not other ways. 
He's the only way to heaven, the only way to resurrection. He's the only way to life. He is the only life. He is the only truth, not a truth, the truth. He's exclusive. He's preeminent. He is the only hope. The most important thing in your life, not just today, every day, is whether or not you have Jesus. My mom is on her literal deathbed this morning. We don't know if she'll last the day. The only, absolutely only thing that matters about her is whether or not she has Jesus. Because if she has Jesus, she has hope. If she has Jesus, her family has hope. I have hope if she has Jesus. Because Jesus made us promises. But if she doesn't have Jesus, there is no hope. Jesus doesn't say, if you have me, you're good. If you don't have me, there are other ways. You can figure it out. You might do okay. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm it. And apart from me, all there is is judgment. Apart from me, you pay for your own sins. Apart from me, you have no hope. That's all that matters in her life. And it's all that matters in your life. My great fear is that some of you will come here Sunday after Sunday, week after week, You'll hear the messages, you'll sing the songs, you'll come to the barbecues, but in your heart you have not believed on Jesus. Your your spouse's faith is not going to save you. Your parents' faith is not going to save you. Your children's faith is not going to save you. My faith is not going to save you. you. It doesn't matter if you know the lingo. It doesn't matter even if you know your Bible. It doesn't matter if you've served in ministry. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice Lawlessness. Do you believe that Jesus is your only hope? Are you desperate for Jesus? Now, if you call yourself a Christian, there has been a moment in your life where you said, I do believe Jesus is my only hope. I do know I need him. I am a sinner and I need Jesus. And I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that his death was sufficient to cover my sins. So I ask him to save me and I believe I am saved and I know no one else can save me. So are you still desperate for him, though? That is my great question. When I see these people, you know, Jesus said things like, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and the branch can't do nothing apart from the vine. He says, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, what keeps you from Jesus each day? What keeps you out of his word? Is it something big or is it something small? Like the morning news. Is that all it takes to distract you from following Christ in the morning? Your phone? A text message? Is that all it takes to derail you for the entire day? To waste another day? Sometimes I think that we treat Jesus like a side of ranch at a restaurant. How many of you guys ever asked for a side of ranch at a restaurant? Okay, you know, probably all of you, right? Well, half the time you don't get it. You know, sometimes you get it. They remember it's amazing. You get your ranch. That's great. I'm happy. Other times you don't get it. And, you know, if you're me, you know what I usually do when I don't get my ranch? I shrug and I eat my meal without, I eat my meal without the ranch because I don't want to bother the server. They look like they're working hard. She looks like she's got a lot on her mind. I'm, or what you do is if you're, you know, you might have a little bit more courage than me. You might do like the half-hearted finger thing, right? As they walk by, oh, she didn't hear me. Oh, well. And then you give up. Then you shrug, Right? How many of us, right, we're like, yeah, I'll follow Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the word. I'm going to develop a prayer life. I want to do these things. I want to be faithful to church, and I want to serve in a ministry, and I want to be used of God. But, you know, you wake up the next day, and you're like, oh, you know. Well, maybe, maybe not today. You know, maybe it's not really convenient right now. You know, there's no passion. There's no desperation. There's no... There's no real need to do it now. You could do it then. You can do it then. And then all of a sudden, you're going to be an old man, an old woman, and you never did anything for Jesus, and you're going to die with a shrug. Or maybe sometimes your life gets really, really messed up, and you come back to Christ, and you say, Jesus, you're all, I'm all yours. I surrender all to you. Help me. And then he helps you. And then after that, you're like, okay, yeah, great, thanks. We should be fighting to seek after Jesus like we're the third elephant in line to get on the ark, and it's starting to rain. <laughs> You know, the the truth is, the greater our sense of desperation and urgency, the smaller the obstacles become. 
right? Like, I don't want to ever bother the server at lunch for that ranch. But if I saw a fire in the corner of the store, I would interrupt everybody's lunch and let them know that there's a fire in the store. You know, when I go to the beach and I take my shirt off, I do not like drawing attention to myself, right? I'm not going to play music. I'm not going to be loud. I'm going to sit there and enjoy myself. But if I saw a shark in the water and this big fin going through, I would make some noise because I don't care at that point if people look at me. Right? I mean, think about it. If I broke, if I locked my keys in my car, my first reaction would not be to break through the window. But if my kid, if Sky was stuck in the car and it was a hot day, I'd break the window. Obstacles, they get smaller when your urgency and desperation get bigger. Think about it. Blind Bartimaeus didn't care that people were telling him to be quiet. The sick woman did not care that she had to fight through the crowds. The Syrophoenician woman did not let herself be rejected or put off. The father did not allow his own doubts to get in the way. The paralytic literally did not mind destroying Jesus' roof to get into his house because they were all desperate for Jesus. They knew he was their only hope, and so nothing stopped them from getting to him. So what obstacles are stopping you from being the person you know you're supposed to be? Where did your desperation go? Right? We don't think we need air until we start drowning. Then we realize we need air. We take Jesus for granted so often. You know, we settle into these complacent lives like everyone else. So many Christians, their lives are no different than their unsaved neighbors. There's no great difference. They can both be good people. They both have the same habits. They both work the same jobs. They raise their kids the same way. There is so much in our Christian life that is meant to be powerful and exclusive and amazing and glorifying to God. Yet so many of us literally settle for the same life as everybody else. When Jesus promises us so much more, He has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. He wants glory from your life. He wants fruit from your life. He wants good for your life. Have you forgotten these things? Now, I don't know why you're here this morning. You can be here for a lot of things. The paralytic came to Jesus because he wanted a healing. Let's finish his story. He's being lowered. Verse 5, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. He didn't come for forgiveness. He came because he wanted to walk. Yet Jesus saw a greater need in his life. And this paralytic, though he came for a healing, he got more from Jesus than he thought he would. A lot of you come to Jesus because you don't want to go to hell. That's great. But Jesus has so much more for you than that. Some of you come to church because eh, maybe you just like the people. You like to be smiled at. You like people that know your name. You, maybe you like a song or two. I don't know if anyone likes our music, but you know, you might like a few songs. You're like, I'm going to come. It's, it's cool. It's a cool place. But what if you got here and Jesus had more for you than just a, a club? Jesus had more for you than just some religious institution. What if he had for you salvation? So, Jesus says your sins are forgiven. Now, that's a problem. Because the Jews had a way to be forgiven. It involved taking a sacrificial animal to the temple and following the law and having the priest do his thing. It, was, it involved the Day of Atonement. They had festivities and holidays where they got forgiven. They had special rules and laws to be forgiven. Yet Jesus sees their faith and says, you're forgiven. So, of course, there are people in the crowd that don't like that. Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? How does this man have the authority to say something like that? It says in verse 8, Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Can you imagine every eye being like, Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. Can you imagine every eye in that room, every Pharisee, every scribe, every traveler that just got there? They all look at this man tied up in his rope, sitting on his pallet, on his stretcher. What would he do? And it says he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. 
Can you imagine the scene of him going out, the four guys running down the stairs, and together the five of them walking him back home, high-fiving him? I imagine him doing one of those things where he clicks his heels, because he can walk, he can move. He obeyed Jesus. He got up, carried it, and went out. The very pallet that carried him his whole life, he now carries it out. That's a miracle. And it says that uh, they were all amazed. In Matthew's story, it says they were awestruck. And we're glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amazed. You know, what could God do in our lives if we were desperate to get to him? Jesus did have the authority to forgive sins. Later on, you know, he would actually lay his own life down to pay as a final sacrifice to pay for the sins of mankind. Just like he had the authority to tell this man to get up and be healed, to fix a broken body. He had the authority to fix his spiritual life, to repair his soul, to make him whole again. He goes home not just walking, but forgiven. Not just his body fixed, but his very heart, his soul, his spirit was fixed, reconciled, forgiven. As he was raised up, Jesus will raise us up. We will be forgiven too. We will be made whole. We are made whole. There is salvation in no one else, Peter would preach later on. A man who saw this miracle. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So if you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and I don't know what you're waiting for, and I don't know what you're hoping in, and I don't know what you're thinking, but Jesus invites you to come to him. He wants to save you. And Christian, follow hard after him. Serve him passionately. Worship him passionately. Keep serving him because we are still desperate for him. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Apart from him, we have nothing. Apart from Jesus, we are nothing. But in him, we find the strength to do all things. In him, we have all we need. In him, we are complete. In him, we can become all that we were created to become. Father, we love you, Lord. And in this life, we get distracted so often. We get tempted. Sometimes, Lord, we feel like we're the only ones who are trying to follow you, surrounded by family and friends that don't seem like they care. Sometimes, Lord, we just, we just don't care ourselves. Father, ignite something inside our hearts that we realize how great in need we are of Jesus Christ, not just at the beginning of our life, but throughout every day of our lives. Help us, Father, to be a people that desperately seek after you, that need you like we need water, that need you every day like we need to eat every day. Father, help us to, and we know that you've promised that if we seek you, we'll find you. That if we knock, you'll open the door. That if we ask, we'll receive. So, Father, instill in us a desperate faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.